when we talk about max aerobic function, are we talking about heart rate as the ultimate, as the really important metric here? So maintaining a particular heart rate during the run? Uh, is, is that the measure that, like how do you know you're in the right place? Yeah, yeah. And then that's where it gets a little tricky because like unless you go into a lab and get your aerobic threshold tested, it's really hard to have like an exact number on it. Um, you know, Dr. Phil Maffetone with the maximum function process, he'll say 180 minus your age is going to give you your. Yeah, that's the math 180 mm -hmm. formula that yep. I thought was fascinating. For it's like uh, in the same way e equals e equals mc squared is fascinating that there could be a formula that captures like optimal running. Yeah. <laughs> so that for people who don't know, that's 180 minus your age. If you train at that heart rate, if you run at that heart rate, you're going to progress a lot. And here's the advantage of that. I think like with any of these things, you want to look at it through where are the advantages here and I need to account for those and then where are the potential disadvantages mm -hmm. and then decide for me as an individual, do these advantages outweigh the disadvantages and what's the alternative approach and is that going to produce more advantages or less? So with, with maximum aerobic function, uh, here's some advantages. Like it is low enough intensity where you can train pretty consistently at a fairly high volume with a very low injury risk with uh, very low like things that are going to maybe lower your quality of life like muscle damage and things like that um, it's a more efficient way in the sense that you're going to be like prioritizing like fat metabolization which um, I mean, if you're looking at like Jeff Volick and or Dr. Jeff Volick and Dr. Dominic Diagostino, some of their research and things like that, like they're going to show that, you know, that's going to be a little cleaner way to go about things from just a recovery standpoint, a breakdown standpoint. So they um, could be like a, what they call like a fat adapted athlete. So you can mm -hmm. go to your fat stores for energy if yeah. you're applying this math. What, what is it called by the way? Math 180? Is that, yeah. is that a good, mm -hmm. is it good? What, what are your thoughts about in general for yourself and for the broader population. I think the MAF 180 formula is about as good of a formula as you're gonna find in terms of capturing as many people as you can get away with capturing with a kind of a universal thing. Uh, like any of these things, I mean, it's, it's more likely kind of on a bell curve where like the bulk of that 180 minus three is probably gonna be a pretty good, at least starting point to kind of figure out where that is. There's some other things you can like maybe use to kind of check it that I like to do. If I'm, let's say I just, I did 180 minus my age and I went out and I started running and it was like, I'm running along and I'm just like, my, my breathing is labored. I'm, you know, I'm struggling to get a sentence out without gasping for breath. Mm -hmm. Well, that's my body telling me I'm probably not actually at my true like math number or my true, like underneath mm -hmm. my true aerobic threshold, like aerobic threshold and maximum aerobic function. You should be able to do that for hours and you should be able to breathe pretty efficiently and talk. Yep. Carry a conversation. Um, other people will say like you, another way to kind of gauge it, if you can breathe in your nose and out your mouth, that's not necessarily the best way to do on a, from a performance standpoint, but it can be a good kind of governor that will allow you to like, if you can, if you can no longer breathe in your nose and out your mouth, you're probably going too fast to actually technically be at your math pace or under your math pace. Yeah. I had a, actually when I was in, in, in better shape, I had trouble getting to that math number. I, I found myself like either I would be doing way too much work. Like it's too hard to do it. It was too hard to get mm -hmm. to that number. I was running a much lower heart rate, like 10 to 20, what do you call that? Beats lower. Mm -hmm. And that's, I, I was still for myself, happy with the pace. It was a good pace. And yeah. and I was felt good. I was smiling and enjoying life. And yeah. uh, I it, and, and with the moment I take myself to that uh, level of like the, the math 180 level, that's like, that felt like a real workout. Yeah. <laughs> and it felt like I can't do that for five, 10, 15 miles. Like I, I started feeling it like this is a one or two mile mm -hmm. thing. No, but I think his answer to that, uh, Phil Meftone's answer is maybe you're supposed to like, uh, what, maybe do some more sprints or something like that or build up your, maybe like I'm too weak yeah. musculature wise to like, uh, yeah, like the, that, that's a sign that you need to work on some stuff. You yeah. can't just keep enjoying life. <laughs> there's, there's two ways to look at that, I think. And I think you're, you're, you're right on. I think that what, what the advice from that, from that kind of a process would say is either you, you're doing too much of it. So it's getting too hard for where your skeletal muscle system is currently at mm -hmm. for that particular activity. So like, I mean, it can be different too. Like if you're cycling versus running, you know, that's a, a little bit of a different mechanic where it can be different, where you could take a super fit cyclist 
and then put them on, you know, the, the amount of volume they're going to be able to tolerate relative to what you're going to do when you remove like impact forces and things like that is going to be lower if they haven't been practicing that activity. So for you, like, you know, you're prioritizing like, uh, uh, uh wrestling and mixed martial arts or not mixed martial arts, but jujitsu type stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, running is maybe kind of that, that, uh, that secondary activity versus the primary activity. But yeah, so what they would say is probably like maybe instead of doing that at, let's say you were doing that for like 30 miles a week or something like that, and it was getting too hard to continue there, they'd say, you know, come back to 20, get used to 20, get comfortable with 20, then let's get you up to 25 and 30 and kind of just like inch you along. One of the intuitions I had about the ways I was failing at running is the form was probably not great. Like the, the way to get to those 30, 40 miles is to get the form right. Mm. Maybe I was doing too big of steps, not the, so like uh, playing with a different gait, playing with a different kind of um, the Just form the of the running. of your form. The, yeah. the economy, the efficiency, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that was the intuition, like I was doing something wrong. But I suppose that's the benefit of these kind of formulas. It challenges you to think like, how can I improve this kind of stuff? Well, and it also, it simplifies it so much that you're forced to, right? You're forced <laughs> to optimize within that real strict parameter versus am I doing my short intervals right, but my long runs wrong? Or am I doing my like long intervals right, but my short intervals? Wrong? And then you just, it kind of complicates things when you start throwing a lot of stuff there. And for most people, especially when they're first getting started, you know, you're, you can't overcomplicate it or you're just going to like, you're going to do like a bunch of half right, half wrong things and then not really know where your progress or your deficits are necessarily at. So uh, I do think this is an amazing approach, especially for people who are just getting into it and building that that foundation. Um, where where I think maybe you want to deviate from that a little bit, especially when you start to get into these events that are operating well outside that intensity. So you take something like, um, you know, let's say it's a race that takes you in the neighborhood of around like 12 minutes or something like that, then you're going to be running significantly faster than your your maximum aerobic function pace. So most of the research is going to say at some point in time, you need to get around to practicing the pace at which you're going to perform at and really fine tuning the mechanics, uh, the efficiencies, uh, how it feels, how to judge it, how to pace it at the pace you're going to try to compete at. So there's obviously like a large range of targets there when we're talking about the endurance world in general, where, you know, you have these shorter events like five kilometers, and then you also have hundred mile races, which are going to typically be quite a bit below your maximum aerobic function in, especially on these trail races.